The whole reason why you're here is to find out if there are any MMORPGs coming up in the next couple years that are worth your time. Buckle in because this is going to be a long as hell video, but there are chapters so you can jump to exactly where you want to. The MMORPG landscape over the last decade or so has seen a lot more misses than hits. It's been a genre starved for something new and just generally good. We are far removed from the gold rush of the mid to late 2000s when companies tried to push MMOs out the door to capitalize on the success of World of Warcraft. Quite frankly, the state of the MMORPG genre right now has felt a bit stale. It's the end of the copyright genre has allowed for some innovation with newer games like Guild Wars 2 and kind of like shifting the way that you play games, Elder Scrolls Online, BDO, but the, the genre feels stale because most of the games that most of us are playing are at least four to five, six, seven years old at this point. The games that we are getting just aren't what we want. And that has us looking to the future and what might be, what possible games could we get that may actually fill that void that we've had since our last great MMO, the one that we personally love, whatever that game is for you. Anyone who's been watching the genre for any amount of time has felt that desperation, that need and desire for something new, something good. And the following MMOs may just be that. Or they may be absolute shit and terrible and or they may never even launch. That is a very real possibility with all of these MMOs. I tried to gather as many as I could, just kind of hoping that one of them hits, please. Just one. We'll come back in a couple in a couple years to this video and you know see if any of this actually made sense at that point, or if none of them worked. That's depressing. Let's move on. We're going to look at all the MMOs I could find that are potentially coming out in the next couple years, and cover three things I'm excited about and one big concern with each one. I'll add some of the usual disclaimers here that. This list, as extensive as it is, I am absolutely going to forget or miss out on some MMOs that you are very, very eager and passionate about. So that is when you can put in the comment section below the MMO that you really want to see, the one that you're super excited about. Let us know because then we can be excited about it too. And then finally, a quick note on the negatives. It felt too easy to just have the negative for almost every single one of them be, well, it may not come out. So I tried to avoid that and give you something a bit more constructive with each one. But that's enough of me talking like this. Let's actually talk about the games. These are the MMOs that might be good. Dune Awakening. Dune Awakening is coming from a familiar name, Funcom. Funcom has, for fans for MMOs, perhaps being a bit of a hit or miss developer and publisher. They are probably best known for Anarchy Online, Age of Conan, Secret World, and more recently, Conan Exiles. And now, now they're bringing us a new MMO with yet another established IP, Dune. And from the sound of it, it might pull as much from Funcom's successful Conan Exiles title as anywhere else. The MMORPG is being called a survival MMO. As they put it, Rise from survival to dominance in a vast and seamless Arrakis, shared by thousands of players. Dune Awakening combines the grit and creativity of survival games with social interactivity of a large, persistent multiplayer game to create a unique, ambitious, open-world survival MMO. Let's get into the positives and the negative. A sandbox-style MMORPG with everything from base building to combat resource gathering, and even your very own freaking helicopters. It has a clear line of progression like you've seen in survival game, from starting with nothing to really growing your character beyond their level to where the style of play grows into something different. I mean, it's kind of hard to get much different from like a knife to like a bombardment from above, right? Speaking of bombardment or combat, the second part is going to be combat. They have something called combined arms, which combined arms just sounds damn fun, like taking Halo combat and throwing it into an MMO. From ranged combat to vehicle combat to melee combat, it'll be interesting to see just how these are balanced together. For example, how will melee stand up against ranged combat? And then will they both be inferior to vehicle combat? Will they be augmented by vehicle combat? 
In a PC Gamer interview, they talked up the fact that they'd have both ground and air vehicles all intermingling with swords, knives, rockets, and mini guns. We have a broad specter of combat capabilities. We have melee weapons like knives and swords. We have range weapons. Uh, then we have ground vehicles and air vehicles. They all come with configurable capabilities like last guns, rockets, um, mini guns, things like that. Uh, you will be fighting on foot, you'll be driving vehicles, you'll be flying in ornithopter, and it all comes together there. It honestly sounds very chaotic, which I guess is kind of the point. But it'll still be interesting to see how it plays out, because in my experience with Funcom games, combat has never really been the necessarily the highlight. Even in Age of Conan, the game that they were trying to kind of innovate on the genre with directional kind of action tab combat. It, it fe felt clunky. It still feels clunky to me. That may just be my personal opinion, but I I really disliked Conan's combat. I loved the animations and things. They were brutal and 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 for the time they were beautiful like graf graphically wise, but the the whole directional thing was just it, it ended up feeling like unnecessary later on. Apart from anything else, why haven't any other MMOs used it since then? And if they have, correct me in the, the comment section below. It helps the it helps with, you know, the whole algorithm thing. The final positive is going to be the environment itself and the fact that it's actually going to be hazardous. A lot of MMOs have often kind of gone away from the idea of PvE meaning environment and instead talked about PvE in terms of player versus enemy. And I like the idea that the environment itself in this game, including the massive sandstorms, are going to be difficult. And things like the giant worm, which will be I think, something that you need to avoid. But they've also talked about how you will eventually be able to use some of these things to your advantage, specifically talked about the sandstorms being used to your advantage. Perhaps I can imagine something using a, a sandstorm as coverage for going in and attacking an enemy base, for example. That's one of the things that I'm really excited to see how they utilize the environment itself to make the world feel more engaging instead of just window dressing for your combat. And that's where we get to our negative, my biggest concern when it comes to Dune. It can be summed up with two words, New World. The reason why I say that is because when New World was in development, it was actually supposed to kind of be this. It was supposed to be a survival, you know, PVP MMO. They have since massively like pivoted away from that and tried to focus on PVE. It was something they started to do about two years before they actually released New World, which at least as far as I'm concerned, that led to massive issues with New World launching without really any clear direction and with like kind of like a, a hodgepodge of things kind of like held together very loosely. Since then, New World has has pivoted harder and harder into the PVE section of that, creating a new player experience that has a like an actual quest line that makes some some logical sense as you proceed through it and everything they've been adding since then really tends to be focusing on making it a more traditional MMO, not as much of a survival MMO. Can a survival MMO work if it, especially if it has like some of the annoying things that you see in survival games that some players love and some players, hey, I called it annoying. So I guess you can kind of get where I feel, but talking about like the need to manage your food, the need to manage your cover, the need, all these survival elements. Can it work in an MMO at a grand scale? All of that said, for fans of Funcom's other work, watching the trailers and interviews around the game, I saw definitely some hallmarks of Secret World and Conan Exiles in it. So if you enjoyed those games and you enjoy this IP, this is going to be a game for you to watch. The next game is going to be pretty similar, but with an entirely different IP. And that's PAX Day. PAX Day is a game that has the eyes of many players for reasons not too dissimilar to Dune. A lot of what they've shown off so far has demonstrated the social building aspect of PAX Day, which makes sense since they're calling it a social sandbox MMO, one that is being made by former EVE Online devs. 
The medieval fantasy MMO is looking to provide something different to the market and there's substantial buzz around it, especially since they've got plans for a big alpha test before the end of 2023. Part of what grabs so much attention with PAX Day was just how incredibly beautiful the game is. Made in Unreal Engine 5 and designed for PC, PAX Day invites players into a world of temporary serenity where you can build up your home with others in the heartland before venturing into the dark wilderness where ghosts and myths await you. PAX Day boasts a player-driven economy where everything in the world is produced by players, whether it's clothes, walls, food, weapons, armor, or tools. For many, it might bring back memories of older sandbox MMOs like Ultima Online. At least that's what it's been doing for me, but much, much more expansive. There's also some survival builder elements here too, but it remains to be seen just how extensive that's going to be. As I already mentioned, the first positive has to be just the beauty of the game. PAX Day's trailers have shown the beauty that Unreal Engine 5 is capable of. Whether it's the sun cascading through the trees, cloth movement, various lighting effects, or draw distances, the game is already something to look at in these early stages. The only caveat here is that trailers can often be very misleading, but we might get a better feel for that later this year when we get our hands on PAX Day and get to try an alpha, depending on whether there's an NDA or not. The second thing is something that we haven't really seen all that much and that's going to be building. Around 2003, it looked like MMOs were going to take a turn for customization. Games like Star Wars Galaxies were already pushing the boundaries on character creation, decoration, and housing. EverQuest 2 launched in 2004 and tried to do the same, but fell back to instances for their homes. Another game that launched in 2004 did away with it entirely, and that's going to be World of Warcraft. And since then, it really hasn't pushed forward. ESO, Star Wars The Old Republic, Final Fantasy XIV, and even New World all have some sort of housing, but it is generally instance and based on pre-made schematics. It is not something that you are building yourself in the open world. The building system in PAX Day only has a few constraints. Don't build on roads or near dungeon instances, for example, but it's open to player creativity and I can't wait to see what players come up with, especially with how popular games like, like Valheim were. Social building has felt like an underdeveloped part of the MO experience for a while now and with the creations that have already been made in more limited games like the one the MMO has mentioned before, the sky is the limit for this game and how the building will impact it. Or I guess the road is the limit and I, there are some physics I believe as well so you can't just you know keep building up and up and up. And, up. and on that note, I have to point to this being something new and refreshing in a space that's looking back at something old. The influence from survival games from EVE Online to Ultima Online to SWG, it's all there, but it also feels like its own unique thing. The game promises to have building, player economies, PvE, and PvP. They want to make everything you do in the game feel impactful and important, and th all of this despite not having any normal cities, only player cities. Which brings me to my next point, and my potential fear. It is going to be a world that completely relies on people, which is kind of a double-edged sword. One of the greatest strengths of an MMO that makes full use of user-generated content is the unique experiences and impactful moments that happen from it. From PvP guild wars to huge player towns, but it's also a frail column. Every piece that gets removed, every batch of players that move on or give up, weaken the game until it eventually all fails. From playing games like Crowfall, Shadowbane, Ultima Online, Warhammer Online, and SWG, all of which had deeply important social components in different ways to having a core gameplay loop, or lack thereof, that didn't require the active populace creating content was important to the future of the game. What will happen when player numbers shrink on a server? Servers which are expected to hold up to 7,000 players. Will large swaths of the heartland become open and useless? Will portions of the game that were once interesting become bland and boring? That's my concern. This next game, anime fans, it's time to rejoice. At least for now, until everyone gets pissed off about monetization. But for now, we're excited about Blue Protocol. 
In an MMO described by the franchise lead as anime come to life, Blue Protocol looks like it'll be launching globally in 2024 after releasing on June 14th, 2023 in Japan. Blue Protocol is a full featured MMO that is being developed by Bandai Namco and published in the West by Amazon Games. It boasts a large open world, extensive character customization and a dynamic action combat system. In this system, everything will happen real time and each class will have four skills that are customizable with skill points as you level up, determining on how your class plays. Because I haven't followed Blue Protocol very much, I went over to MMObyte.tv to check out what Styx has to say about Blue Protocol. And if you're interested in the game at all, I would highly recommend both checking out Styx's MMO channel as well as the website. It is a website that is designed in such a way that it gives you the most, so much valuable information so easily and readily available. I cannot tell you how much Styx's website helped me with this video. So thank you, if Styx, if you're seeing this, thank you so much for putting that on your website. I appreciate you. I have linked Styx's website down below, so please check it out. This game is going to be for players that are looking for a more action-based, I can do everything type MMO. At least that's the vibe I'm getting from Blue Protocol. Looking at their classes, all six appear to be different flavors of DPS. I wouldn't go into this expecting class roles and interdependency. In fact, it's been stressed that Blue Protocol can be played either solo or with friends. All dungeons in the game can be soloed, but you'll also be able to head into them with other players either through matchmaking or picking a specific group. The dungeons will scale in difficulty with the number of players. It's a sort of optional, solo, optional co-op version of MMO play. As for other PvE content, there will be raids focusing more on individual bosses and less on long, sprawling dungeons or planes like EverQuest or World of Warcraft. To be more like, I guess, Final Fantasy XIV, where you just go and kill the boss for the most part. Blue Protocol will be free to play with microtransactions, the depth of which remains to be seen, but there will certainly be differences between the current Japanese version and what we will get here in the West next year. At the moment, there is a season pass as well as a premium store with an alternative currency, though there have been promises that store items will be cosmetic as to avoid pay to win. The version currently out in Japan may be considered pay to win by some, especially with the season pass and the ability to increase success rates on crafting, but I'd put it firmly in the pay for convenience realm, and that's before we see how or if monetization will change under Amazon Game Studios. Before we get into the positives and the negatives, I want to leave you with something Sticks said that I think sums it up very nicely. This is a large AAA budget full action combat anime MMO, the only one of its kind other than PSO2 New Genesis. It's going to be narrative driven with lots of story content. You'll be capable of playing every class on a single character without the need for alts and so much more. Honestly, there is a lot of hype around Blue Protocol and there's good reason for it. It looks good, it looks like it's gonna play well, and there's cautious optimism that it won't be terribly pay to win at least. Let's talk about the positives. The first is going to be that it's anime. I kinda had to talk about how this is bringing a new look and a new vibe to the genre, right? Genshin Impact goes MMO. The anime MMO has been attempted before, but few have done well due to a variety of issues. For many players and some of my friends, this is a welcome addition to a landscape that is very, very heavily dominated by gritty medieval fantasy settings, or at least medieval fantasy settings that may be not as gritty. More settings I think will always be welcome in a genre that is so singularly focused with a slight nod to the occasional sci-fi setting. I welcome any of these new looks for the genre because it brings the same kind of core gameplay, the group gameplay, to a more broad audience that might not have been able to enjoy it before because they just didn't like fantasy settings, not because they didn't enjoy MMOs. The second part is going to actually be innovation. There are some innovations coming out with this game that are less bright new shiny toys and more iterations on older mechanics and systems. For example, the utilization of multi-classing on a single character, but doing it in a game that doesn't necessarily have a traditional Holy Trinity the way Final Fantasy XIV does. But even more so is the built from the ground up idea of scaling to group size. Many MMOs have done this in different ways, but they've usually been added on after the fact 
with solo dungeons, small group dungeons, etc. Seeing a game launch with this as a key feature will be interesting, even if it's just to see how the public reacts to it. And our final positive is that it's a game that may respect your time. From everything I've seen about Blue Protocol so far, it looks like a game that is going to respect it. At least as long as the big negative that I'm concerned about doesn't come to pass anyway. But hold that thought for a second, because let's just, we're still we're still saying good things. With a loot system that rewards you with crafting items rather than randomized drops, a dungeon system that allows you to kind of choose how you wish to play, and an open world that gives you options to explore, the game is obviously setting itself up as being a game that you can you can jump into, play, and feel like you're getting something out of it as you play, whether it's 30 minutes, an hour, or eight hours. But there's concerns, and they're tied to that. Some of the negatives I have are in direct opposition to the positives, like, for example, if the respect for time will result in a loss of achievement. Will there be long-term value to your memories in the game? Will items matter to you if they're so readily available through grinding that you don't actually have to like search out that single item? You just have to get enough of the, the crafting materials for it. My biggest concern and the one that I want to focus on is going to be monetization. It kind of has to be with a free to play game. I don't think you can really look past the free to play title and not have some concerns over monetization because games have to find a way to make it worth paying for the development and MMOs are not cheap to develop. They're not cheap to maintain and they're not cheap to expand. So the money has to come from somewhere. And the question is always going to be where and without a box fee and without a subscription fee, it's going to have to come from microtransactions. They've talked a lot about cosmetics as being how they're going to do this with even with the, the season pass, especially in the West under Amazon Game Studios. But my concern is more about if that doesn't meet the metrics they need to, how are they going to kind of massage it? How are they going to find ways to get just a little bit more money out to make the game worthwhile? It's a concern that I will probably have for as long as the game exists. So it's not one that's going to go away just at launch and it just, you know, it's just going to kind of be lingering there. The concern that's probably going to be similar for the next game. Chrono Odyssey. Chrono Odyssey is an upcoming MMO with a unique time manipulation bend to it and it's in development by South Korean studio NPixel, developer of Grand Saga. This game is probably competing with PAX Day on the list for the most gorgeous gameplay reveal. The fact that they're both beautiful and both being made in Unreal Engine 5 is no coincidence. But what is Chrono Odyssey exactly? It will be an action combat MMO that will also not sport the traditional Holy Trinity, at least as far as we know. It does seem like there will be a tank class of sorts, as well as a DPS, and the ability to swap weapons and change the playstyle of your class could lead to the same kind of support-esque system we see in modern MMOs like, like New World. Speaking of weapons, the combat stands out in this game with impressive looking skills and scope, whether you're freezing enemies in place with ice, shielding from attacks, or tackling giant raid bosses with your friends. While the strength of this MMO is clearly its combat and visuals, there are other things that were shown in the trailer too, like the ability to climb and manipulate time that adds some extra depth to this game and makes it more interesting. But let's circle back for the first positive to the combat. It looks kind of amazing. I don't think I've seen more interesting looking combat in the MMO than we're seeing in the trailers here for Chrono Odyssey. It's a combination of shielding, dodging, jumping, and attacking when you get openings, which makes me think of more action-based games like Elden Ring. And while most players probably wouldn't like an MMO with the same level of difficulty as a Souls-like, combat that works similarly will be a nice and refreshing take from the spammy combo-based action combat we've seen before. And if they have PvP, especially arena-based PvP, ooh, that would be fun. That would be so much fun. And I, I like, I'm not a huge fan of like open world PvP. I don't think that's any shocker to anyone, but I do like structured PvP and structured PvP that has some like, you know, like kind of like skill level to it rather than just gear. I'm down. I want to play. I, you know, I mean, for now, like my main PvP game that I enjoy is going to be either World of Warcraft or Guild Wars 2 for the same reasons. So, yeah, the next positive is, of course, the beautiful, beautiful graphics. Of all the games coming out, there's really two that are standing out based on their trailers, at least for me, when it comes to visuals. 
but I think Chrono Odyssey has the edge over PAX Day just because of the sheer amount of action that we have been shown in the trailers, the sheer amount of story and, and, and crazy looking bosses that we get to see. Combat looks thrilling and exciting with skills that look weighty, but not overly dramatic. Hair physics, grass physics, and incredible lighting make it look damn near like Elden Ring. It remains to be seen if this can be pulled off, but it looks fucking cool. The next part is unique to this game, and that's the, the, the dynamics of time stopping and slowing. A game that has Chrono in the title is going to have to have something to do with time, after all. And that's one of the big selling points of the MMO, as several different skills are shown off like freezing time, slowing down time, and outright reversing time. The last of which will be very helpful to a player like myself when I yeet myself off of cliffs on accident. Some players have brought up concerns with how this will work in practice in an MORPG, but I can see it working well as a sort of area effects skills. Slowing and speeding up in-game actions has been in games for decades, but adding the visuals to it like you'd see in a single player game would be really awesome to see. And that brings me to the concern. The big concern. The same damn concern. Monetization. It kind of has to be. And I also have MMO Byte to thank Again, because they're the reason why I'm so concerned about monetization. Because they dug up info on Grand Saga, the previous game released by NPixel, a gacha style game. Gacha meaning a loot box style game that uses randomization and has been used extensively in games like Genshin Impact. While sometimes controversial, even running into legal battles, the model is lucrative for companies willing to use it, and Grand Saga reportedly made a billion dollars using this system. So for players that are averse to gacha systems, like myself, who honestly cannot stand these sort of money draining in-game randomized systems, it'll be something to watch carefully. For me, if Chrono Odyssey makes weapons or something like that part of a gacha system, like it's gonna be a skip. Like I, I, I no matter how good the game looks, I wouldn't just wouldn't have fun playing a game like that. But we'll just have to wait and see exactly what they're going to do with it. We still have some time before that happens. This next game is perhaps one of the most recognizable on the list because it's a sequel, Arch Age 2. Arch Age was originally released in 2014 from Kakao Games and XL Games and we're now officially getting a sequel. We're about three years out from the initial announcement of Arch Age 2 back in 2020 and we still don't have a ton of information. We do know, however, that Arch Age 2 will be a sandbox MMORPG. I mean, it couldn't really be anything else, right? Like it it had to be a sandbox MMO or you'd piss off a lot of people. Kind of like when EverQuest and EverQuest 2 were pretty vastly different. Oops. There will be extensive player housing, ships, and naval warfare. It'll have action combat and non-linear progression. Despite having precious little information about the game, we might actually be getting it sooner than most of these MMOs on here as quarter two financial reports from Kakao Games target the second half of 2024 on both PC and console for Arch H2. And stop me if you've heard this before, but it's being developed in Unreal Engine 5 and will sport a seamless open world with wide open spaces, spaces that I assume will be completely full of housing within like two weeks of launch. It should be noted that a lot of the information out there is assumptions based on what the first Arch Age was like, Besides the little bit we got confirming action combat, group trade routes, improved and improved housing with towns and guilds. The first positive is just that it's going to be sandbox. There are few MMOs out there that are really, in, in true nature, sandbox MMOs. MMOs that kind of let you decide how you want to enjoy the game. Things like crafting, things like building, things like combat, thing, basically having the option to do multiple different things instead of instead of kind of guiding you just towards one thing and only one thing. Whenever I think of a sandbox MMO, I, I don't know why this is. these are the two MMOs that come up, but Star Wars Galaxies and Ultima Online are the two games that are always to me the, the representation of what a sandbox MMO is. A lot of other people will have different ones, but that's kind of what it is for me. Hopefully it's kind of like that. Second is going to be PVP because there's really not a lot of games out there that are going to be focusing a ton on PVP. Arch Age is known for its PVP and seeing naval PVP in Unreal Engine 5 is just going to be awesome to see. I can't wait to see how Arch Age 2 harnesses that engine. 
They're also going for a more action style combat with this addition of Archage, and I think of the, the games going this way, it's the most likely to have the most extensive PvP using that combat. Last is going to be building, which is going to be a common thread with a lot of these games in Unreal Engine 5, because I'm excited to see how they, they take on, on building different housing and things like that, a lot like with Pax Day. And it's the same for Archage 2. Housing is an important part of Archage, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the sequel. Non-instance homes, player cities, and towns all sound great, which is something we got mentioned in the, in the video back at the end of 2022 from Kakao. Seeing how they they implement housing in this game and non-instance housing specifically with the ability to build is something I'm really excited to see. But it's Kakao. Monetization is a concern. I personally never got into Archage because of one key factor. Labor points. Labor points in Archage are essentially the currency to do things in game, limiting your crafting or harvesting. In Archage, labor points were basically something that blocked you from doing pretty mundane things at times. Labor points have also at various times been the subject of heated debate as they were tied to pay elements in game with paying players receiving substantial benefits in labor points. It was a system I freaking loathed. Time locking basic content and then encouraging pay for the same content? Honestly, there's no telling if RJ2 will have a similar system in place or not, but until we get an idea of exactly how the game is going to monetize and how it will work, I have reservations based on experiences with the first game. These next MMOs are going to be the indie MMOs. MMOs that are coming from independent developers that a lot of us may have been waiting for decades or more. First, let's talk about Corpunk, perhaps the game that is most likely to launch soonest out of the indie MMOs. For a while, Corpunk looked like we'd be getting the isometric MMO sooner rather than later, but the top-down MMORPG from Artificial Core has faced some difficult delays, some from their studio, others externally. While Artificial Core is based out of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, the studio's core development studio is located in Kiev, Ukraine. It's an MMO that's described by IGN as being part Cyberpunk, part Diablo, and part Ultima Online. It'll feature a seamless open world and a refreshing setting that intermingles fantasy elements with futuristic sci-fi. My first positive for this game, some of y'all are going to laugh. I am well aware that this positive sounds silly. I get it. Feel free to laugh, but Fog of War. Fog of War is an underrated addition to game for adding suspense dating back to some of the earliest real-time strategy games. Going around a corner and being shocked by enemies is harder to achieve with top down, so the fact that they've included Fog of War to keep the suspense is a good sign to me. Like I said, it's probably a very minor thing, but one that makes me happy to see anyway. I guess the secondary part of pointing out top Fog of War in the first place could also be the fact that the game is top down, something that is underrepresented in MMOs with the exception of games like Lost Ark. But this game will have a much more stylized look and hopefully a lot fewer microtransactions. This game will also follow the path of several MMOs before it on this list and present options for the player. While I personally prefer a game with a heavier push toward group play, having options is a benefit for a wider adoption, and Corepunk has set out to be an MMO where virtually everything can be done solo, with the exception of raids and world bosses. There's an interesting function here that for many players, they may see this as either a positive or a huge negative, but it bears speaking about. In Corpunk's frequently asked questions, they mentioned that you can obtain the same item levels and character development playing solo. It'll be interesting to see how they balance this and how they find ways to still incentivize grouping up, lest the game become ultimately a solo game you see people in, or maybe a bit like Diablo 4, for example. The last positive is just going to be the setting, the fact that it is a fantasy cyberpunk sci-fi MMO. It's new and kind of fresh to the genre. I think I'd be less interested in Core Punk if it was just another fantasy setting or a dark fantasy setting like Diablo. It's not that those settings are bad, it's just that they're kind of overrepresented. So whenever a game tries something a bit different, a bit new, it's nice to see with my old eyes. And Core Punk is doing it in a way that nods to the familiar with the fantasy elements mingling with the sci-fi cyberpunk elements, so it's kind of creating its own thing. 
So props to them for taking a chance on a newer style in a, in a way, a newer setting, their own setting. But there's also a concern I have regarding what they're doing in that setting, and that's their character limitations. I worry about an MRPG that takes out a huge part of the RPG part of it, creating your own character. There are of course single player games that do this well, and we are still considered RPGs, but for an MMO where you're going to be seeing other versions of yourself, at least somewhat, it can be immersion breaking. I suppose in some ways it's a bit like League of Legends in that aspect, so it's possible to overcome it with gameplay, but it was perhaps one of the things I liked least about another pseudo MMO, Vindictus. I don't have player identity because the player wasn't actually mine, it was created by the studio. But that said, recent developments with Core Punk over the last couple years, I guess it's not really recent, but after investigating how Core Punk is, is handling character creation has assuaged some of these concerns for me. Because even though there are going to be limitations, where for example you're not going to be able to make a mercenary into an orc, or an orc into a mercenary, you're still able to make your own character through, through pretty robust customization of appearance, as well as different types of weapons and things like that. Each of the classes or heroes will have three weapon masters to choose from that have unique abilities and gaming styles, as well as 10 branches of passive talents. You'll also be able to customize your character's look within the framework of the hero. Your character is going to be able to visually look different from another character. I see this as a bit of a half measure, which actually isn't all that different from what BDO currently does. Essentially what they've done is they've gone and locked the, the the specific like race of the character like so you have the orc and the human and they're in their own specific archetype that you can't really cross into different archetypes. So you cannot be an, an a destroyer that is an orc in this game, but at least your destroyer can look very different than the next destroyer which is a nice upgrade from the kind of the hero system we had before that really reminded me too, too much of Vindictus and League of Legends. And if this game didn't already remind you of League of Legends with even just the UI, it certainly was there. So this is a nice change to see that they have, as they have gone through development over the last couple of years, they have adjusted and made some changes and it actually makes me personally more excited. So, so I guess the, the negative here is kind of turning into a positive. This next game is an interesting one. Camelot Unchained. Camelot Unchained was first announced all the way back in December of 2012 with a teaser trailer from Mark Jacobs of City State Entertainment. Mark Jacobs has an extensive history with some of the most interesting and well-integrated PvP MMOs, including Dark Age of Camelot and Warhammer Online as the lead designer for both games under Mythic Entertainment. Camelot Unchained for many feels like a sort of spiritual successor to Dark Age of Camelot, consisting of three realms with massive RVR battles, you know, and I'll be straight up here, the positive points here were difficult, and it's a lot with how I feel like the game has mishandled some of the trust in it over the last couple years in a way some other indie MMOs have as well. But it's also how some of the idea of the game, the very basis of the game, may have actually already been done by a game that kind of failed in Crowfall. Let's get into the positives and the negative. Camel Unchained is a tri-realm RVR focused game with the entirety of the game built around realm versus realm PvP. This worked exceptionally well in Dark Age of Camelot and was a focus for Warhammer Online and how the game suffered because it didn't have a third realm to help with balance that out. Both of those games were under Mark Jacobs, so if there's a team that could do RVR well, you'd imagine it would be the one that is led by Mark Jacobs. The second positive is that there will be pretty extensive crafting and building. They seem to be approaching crafting and building as an important part of the process, one that will feel rewarding in itself and be essential to the game. I, I told you that these were, <laughs> you know, I told you that the, the, the positives on this one were a little hard. I apologize. They're kind of short. The next one is just size. As early as one of the Kickstarter, Camel Unchained has talked about the sheer size of their battles. Back then, they were aiming for 500 to 1,000 players in a battle at a time, and for years after the Kickstarter, they showed impressive scale using their own engine. The goal is to have these massive battles while maintaining performance. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I wasn't going to use whether a game 
would or would not release as a negative. It was hard not to do that with this game. But the clearest point I could make about Camel Unchained in, in the negative is the frustration that's bubbled up around the game over the years as they appear to have made similar mistakes to other indie MMOs, like creating a second game among a myriad of delays. But perhaps more so, the game has struggled through many, many more delays, delayed refunds, which have marred what would have been brighter news, like the additional 15 million in investment the game received in 2022. I'd have preferred to point to concerns about the singular focus on RVR, lending the game to follow the same path as Crowfall, which ultimately did fail, but I think the bigger concern is the missteps that City State over the last years has continued to make. To fans of, of Camelot Unchained, I apologize that I couldn't be more positive about this game for you. But if you want to be more positive about it, please let us know down in the comment section below what are the things that you are excited about with this game. Moving from one somewhat less polished and less happy version of indie MMOs to one that was, at least in 2022, the darling of the indie MMO space, Ashes of Creation. Can an always-on PvPVE MMO work? Can it work on a grand scale in Unreal Engine 5 that uses a node-building system that has the potential to make each server somewhat unique? And can it do it all while adding in fast, engaging combat? Thrilling PvE and PvP battles, evolving stories, beautiful weather dynamics that impact your character, all on the budget of an indie MMO. That's what Ash the Creation is hoping to answer, and it remains one of the greatest hopes out there for anyone who hasn't forsaken indie MMOs just yet. And it might actually be in good company, because one could argue that the most successful indie MMO so far is actually in some ways very similar. Always on PvP MMO, Albion Online. Many would argue that Ash of Creation is trying to do this as on a much grander scale though, and not just because it's in Unreal Engine 5. Ash of Creation's made the decision to move to Unreal Engine 5 last year, and it's been paying off. Not only did the new, beautiful visuals catch mass attention from the, for the game even from huge MMO content creators like Asmongold and Lazy Peon, but it makes the game look more contemporary. This is especially so in the environment, where you can see the weather dynamics that they've shown off. Weather that is really, really making the game feel immersive and exciting, even without having played it. Speaking of contemporary, Ash of Creation is going to have a sort of hybrid combat between action and tab target. The combat looks like it'll be somewhere in the middle, which sounds perhaps the most like Guild Wars 2. There's even going to be the ability to toggle between the two different targeting systems, a tab target system and an action combat system. There's something to be said here about trying to give, give a sort of like a, a choice to the player, players that are pretty diverse in their opinions on how much they like or hate either type of combat. So giving an option will be great if they can manage to balance it at least. But I couldn't get past the pause without talking about perhaps the most unique part of Ashes of Creation and that is the node system. Nodes will essentially be the world of Ashes of Creation. Villages or potential massive cities all created through player input. This is different from player crafted cities like what they mention in some of these other MMOs like Arch Age 2 and Pax Day. This is deliberate growth of certain areas of the map at the expense of other areas. Nodes are pre-formatted based on various factors, including the dominant contributions of players from their race to the, their type such as divine, economic, military, or scientific. Nodes lead to both PvE and PvP content, and are as far as I can tell, the backbone of the game. They are also the most interesting part of the game that's not really done in any other game, at least not to the extent that they're doing it. The negative for Ashes of Creation for many people is going to be about launching and, and things like that. But for me, it always comes down to one thing. One thing that the, the MMO genre has shown for years is a tough sell. And that's always on PvP that has a negative to it. It's something, talking about this is going to, without a doubt, be spicy. It's, it's perhaps the single part of Ashes of Creation that gets the most people fired up because the players that want this are very excited about it and they don't want people like myself talking any shit about PvP because they don't have the options to play the, the type of game they want to play. And people that hate PvP are kind of in the same camp that I am thinking about this 
pseudo hardcore PvP style, always on PvP, where you don't get to opt in, it's just how the game is, as being a big negative and something that may make them shy away from the game. Now, if Ash of Creation were just trying to be the biggest, best PvP MMO, I think it's completely fine. The problem I see is that I don't think that is the goal of Ash of Creation. I feel like they're trying to redefine the genre and create a massive game, a huge MMO. It's It, it just seems like their aspirations are much larger than perhaps the market is for a game that forces you to have the potential to be ganked by people. It's just kind of how we've seen the genre go. Ultima Online added Tremel. World of Warcraft got rid of their they're always on PvP unless you're on a, even even when they even got rid of the PvP servers, I think. And now it's all opt in PvP. Everything has kind of shifted away from forcing you to engage in PvP. It's not to say there aren't other games out there. Mortal Online 2, I believe Eve Online as well. There are games out there that do have a non opt in opt out way. But even newer MMOs like New World, a game that was built upon the foundations of PvP, you have to opt in. It'll be interesting to see if they can do it. A video this freaking long. My dinner is waiting. Shit. Okay, but onward to the next game. Pantheon, Rise of the Fallen. Pantheon Rise of the Fallen is an in-development MMORPG from Visionary Realms. The game was the brainchild of Brad McQuaid, who sadly passed away mid-development, with the team deciding to carry on Brad's vision and finish the game. Like many of the games in this list, Pantheon has had a bit of a tormented development cycle, with several changes along the way, perhaps none quite as consequential as the new changes in art style which you're seeing on screen now. Pantheon is a PvE-focused MMORPG that hopes to bring back class interdependence, difficulty, and some of the social aspects of MMOs seen more in older games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft Classic. It hopes to do this in a modern way by using minimal action sets for combat, unique traversal mechanics like seamless climbing, and an innovative lore delivery system called Perception. It's also the only game on this list I've actually played. Okay, well not quite, there's one, I think there's one more, but it's the one that I've played the most extensively, and actually enjoyed. Class interdependence is key to Pantheon's build, perhaps more so than anything else. The game has from the very beginning been about class roles, and it's why so many former or current EverQuest and WoW Classic players have flocked to it. It's promising an updated version of that type of game that they loved, and one that is increasingly rare, as one can see from the myriad of triple A MMOs in this video that have been moving further and further away, not just from the Quaternity, DPS, Tank, Healer, CC support, but also the Trinity of Tank, Healer, DPS. Many upcoming MMOs seem to be homogenizing classes into utility DPS, meaning there's no interdependence even when grouping is there. Pantheon seeks to change that and return to a quaternity where classes work together to overcome challenge. Speaking of challenge, that is another huge part of this game. Things like enemy dispositions are designed to make each encounter difficult and different, making players think about how to engage and handle situations as they arise. Collecting up to tens of enemies and destroying them with AoEs isn't the name of the game here. Each enemy is supposed to be a challenge and with your limited action sets, you're expected to have to make the most of some of the more difficult choices with what skills to use instead of just spamming whatever is available. And the final thing that I want to point out here as a positive is near and dear to my heart, and that's lore and story, specifically lore. The way Pantheon is talking about using perception, which pings at you, urging you to discover more, or not, is a very interesting and immersive way for the game to unfold its secrets for you. I think it's a way that many players who may normally skip through the dialogue will actually get to enjoy the story the game has to offer. It feeds it to you in a more organic way that's not as, as basic as just seeing a scroll and looking at it, it's more like unraveling mysteries and making it more engaging and, and active. Concerns for Pantheon come down to scope, a concern that could perhaps apply to most of these MMOs, but maybe more so with Pantheon since it relies heavily not on player created content the way a PvP or sandbox MMO does, but on content created and maintained by a team, a small team. For Pantheon to be successful, they need a full and immersive world that promises adventure. 
dungeons with enemies that will be memorable, combat that will be challenging, and a world worth traversing. Basically, the concern with Pantheon is simply, can they substantially fill out the world? Can they create enough content with the team that they have? We'll end indie MMOs with something completely different, and that's Eternal Tombs. Eternal Tombs was formerly known as War of Dragnarok's. For this game, I'm going to diverge a little bit from the positives and negatives format to give a general overview of the most interesting aspect of it, a live dungeon master. Described as a dynamic warfare MMORPG where the dungeon master shapes the world as you play, Eternal Tombs rebranded recently because they made a big change in their combat moving from tab targeting to more of a unique style of combat that's not as arduous or boring as the previous tab target combat style that they've been using. But the most interesting part of this sandbox MMO is that they're presenting it as the ultimate D&D-like experience for MMORPG players on PC. The way this will work is they're having staff members who play alongside the community as dungeon masters. If nothing else, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, what power and limitations will be on these dungeon masters, and if it's maintainable. Live events in EverQuest and Ultima Online were some of the coolest things I ever experienced in an MMO, and Eternal Tombs looks like they're trying to bottle that excitement and make it into the core gameplay loop. It's one of, it's it's a gamble they're taking and there's a lot a lot of questions about it, but it's something so new and unique that I thought I'd at least put it on your radar just in case you wanted to check it out. Quick side note here on Eternal Tombs for fans of EverQuest I talked to the creator of Eternal Tombs a little bit, and they mentioned that there may be a lot, a couple little Easter eggs in there for fans of EverQuest. Like, for example, let's say an island in the middle of a desert that may or may not have some specters on it. I don't know exactly what it's going to come up to be, but it's at least like a new and exciting take on, on the genre, and I want to see what comes from it. And the fact that they're having Easter eggs to EverQuest, I'm not going to complain about that. These next MMOs are all in some sort of form of early access, with persistent servers, or at least mostly persistent servers, that you can jump in and play right now but the game itself hasn't fully launched. We're gonna start with perhaps the most different of them all, Palia. Palia opened into public open beta on August 10th of 2023 and is offering an entirely different experience than what most MMOs do. A cozy life sim, but with MMO scope. Since it's already been released into a beta state, we've actually got some reviews and since they're fresh, we'll diverge again from the three positives and one negative framework to cover some of the highlights instead. Polygon refers to Palia as an adorable, cozy life simulator MMO that generates endless amounts of serotonin and dopamine in my brain. It's also a clear work in progress. Every intriguing clue and tantalizing hint seems to lead to an under construction sign or a brick wall. PC Invasion says that Palia is beautiful and heartfelt, but bare boned. The general consensus on Polya all points to its potential. It's a life sim with fishing, building, farming, dating, crafting, and yes, I repeat, it is an MMO that has dating in it. A romancing mechanic that you can use with the villagers, not unlike, I suppose, the closest thing to point to would be Stardew Valley. It has a distinct artistic style and is hitting at an underrepresented market in MMOs. For every Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing fan who's ever wondered what it will be like to fully expand into MMO form, Polya appears to be trying to do that, but it sounds like that there's a lot of work to go. What's distinctly lacking, and by design, at least at this point, is combat. With no antagonist in the game, combat is not a focus. However, that doesn't mean that there won't ever be. From Palia's website, they said the following. Many people have asked if Palia will have combat. Well, Palia won't be entirely free of conflict. Combat isn't the core of the focus. Over time, we'll have combat-like adventures, but players will be able to opt out of those experiences, and that combat won't involve players fighting other players. We want players to know that they exist in a low-pressure world largely devoid of physical, social, and emotional threats. As such, we feel that player versus player combat is antithetical to our core experiential goals. The pause of this game is going to be the life sim elements, providing a different way to engage with the MMO, adding a collective social style of gameplay that focuses on cooperative play. The negative is going to be, can they fill it out with enough content to make it compelling? 
There's a reason why so many MMOs have fallen onto gameplay loops of combat, experience, level, gear, repeat. It's easy to expand on and it's a known formula. Talia is shifting that formula away from combat and instead focusing on what are normally tertiary activities in other MMOs. Building, story, harvesting, crafting, etc. I think this is actually doable. I already have friends who absolutely love this game. There is a market for it as long as they can make it into a satisfying gameplay loop with enough content, enough specific content feeding that type of life sim that it will be, you know, kind of infinitely playable. Kind of the way think games like Stardew Valley is. The, the formula is already there, at least in the single player game. Polya just needs to find the way to adapt that into a multiplayer MMO experience. How they fill out through this beta test will be what decides if Polya can fulfill that niche or if it's just going to simply fall by the wayside as a interesting novelty and a new thing that didn't really work out. Speaking of interesting things that may or may not work out, Fractured Online is an interesting one. Fractured Online has had a unique development, let's say. Probably not quite unique, but at least interesting. I actually reviewed this game when it first came out into Early Access last year, and I found it to be intriguing, but still very, very empty. It was a game in the vein of Ultima Online that lacked a lot of the key features that Ultima Online, a game that came out in 1997, had when it launched. A game that needed a lot more work, but that had some interesting dynamics to it, like the approach to PvP being world-bound. Since then, Fractured Online has parted ways with their publisher, Gameago, early in 2023. They pulled the game from early access and back into closed development. Later in the year, they opened up for a timed testing session and in September of 2023 announced a roadmap to early access, which stated the game should be entering early access in about three to five weeks, putting it somewhere in October or November of 2023. Their goal of this early access now on their own without Gameago is to have a bug-free build, a solid endgame, long-term character progression, and essentially a launch suitable enough to be used as a relaunch without planned future wipes. And yes, it will have NPCs in the city, which that was one of my biggest complaints about the game, is that the cities that you, you were in felt like ghost towns. They, there was just nothing there. There was very little furniture. There was no NPCs anywhere. Hello? Hello? Is anyone here? Anyone? Hello? Why is everyone gone? The game just felt completely unpolished and unfinished, and I'm hoping that now with Dynamite completely in control, that they are able to kind of take over the game and, and make it what they wanted to make in the first place without any excess from a publisher wanting certain things or rushing it out the door. I'm interested to see what they can come up with with this PvPVE MMO, top-down MMO, that has more sectioned off PvP than other games have in the past. It reminds me a little bit of Ultima Online with Tramel and Felucia, and it's gonna be, I'm curious to see what happens. Because I have been personally waiting for a game like that, an updated version of Ultima Online, one that kinda hits the same notes in, in, in different ways. And there's some, there is some interesting things that they're doing here, like, how you learn abilities by fighting other creatures. So it'll be interesting to see what exactly Fractured Online can do. If you want to see more about like what Fractured Online is actually about, I've linked that in the description down below. I was so, so tempted to put this next one in the Indie MMO section, but I think it fits better in this early access section, and that's Star Citizen. Given its huge budget and the fact that it is currently in a playable state, and a playable state that really costs about between $45 and $65, depending on if there's a sale or not, to actually enter the game and play. So really, roughly what you'd be paying for most early access games. Star Citizen, for many people, is going to be a, a more known quantity. So let's actually jump directly into the positives and the big negative when it comes to Star Citizen. The first positive for me when it comes to Star Citizen is the fact that it's shaping up to be a triple A sci-fi MMO in a market that has very few triple A sci-fi MMOs. There are the likes of EVE Online, Star Wars The Old Republic, and Star Trek Online, but all those games serve different functions and one of them, notably Star Wars The Old Republic, has a bit of an uncertain future under a new developer at Broadsword. 
Star Citizen, if it launches and provides all it's promising, could truly shake up the landscape of not just sci-fi MMOs, but all MMOs. Speaking of, Spaceflight already looks pretty damn great in Star Citizen, and it's something you can see by tuning in to watch some streams on Twitch or YouTube videos of the game. Some of the things I've seen while watching Smashly over on Twitch are just freaking nuts. I got to jump in myself and, and play around with the, the space combat, and I was kind of like, I mean, I suck at that, so like I'm not the one to like to look at on, on anything, but I, I was able to float around a bit, so that was pretty cool. I think that one, one of the things that was really the most interesting to me is seeing Star Citizen's flight not out in space, where it just kind of feels, at least to me, a little bit slower, but on the planets where you're kind of flying around the planets, something that actually has kind of been a, a criticism of, let's just say, another space game that may or may not be single player. I mean, hell, you can even use flight sticks in Star Citizen already. The last positive is going to be the fact that Star Citizen is going to be a full-fledged MMO that is socially motivated with ship crews and interdependence. It's, I believe, it's something that will set something Star Citizen apart from other expansive space games that we have already played, like Starfield or No Man's Sky. It's going to be entirely different piling a ship with your friends than with NPCs, after all. But we also have to talk about the negatives with Star Citizen, and honestly, yes, there's going to be quite a lot of them, but we have to focus on one. Concerns over eventual release, concerns over scope creep and playability are all big, but the biggest concern for me, and I guess this is saying a lot about who I am as an MMO player, is monetization. It's not that Star Citizen is pay to win. In fact, there are several threads that go into detail explaining how multiple parts of the game can be earned. Paying for them is just a way to speed it up. But that hasn't stopped players from putting thousands into the game, a game that hasn't actually fully released. Ships like the A2 Hercules reach as high as $750. $750 for an in-game item in a game that again has not released. <laughs> What I have found in my research is that yes, you can grind for what seems to be a reasonable amount of time to get the very item that is selling for $750. But the fact that they are already monetizing in this way and providing these kind of shortcuts is a concern for me. And I understand that a lot of this is is part of how they figure to 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 in, increase like, you know, the continued development of the game, but for a game that's already topped like as far as we know, is the most expensive MMO ever, including AAA MMOs, it feels there's something off here for me. There's something about selling the ships, selling in-game ships that just feels off. And even if it's grindable, you know, like I, for me, that's that's my concern is just how is it going to be monetized? It, will this get worse? Will it get better? It just it's it. <sighs> There's something about it, you know, something about that in-game item and also how it's going to play out with secondary markets, secondary markets that could potentially make a lot more money by selling things for more and how that will impact the way the game actually plays and works out. We've seen it in other games with things as simple as Chrono and WoW tokens, you know? Now in these next MMOs, these last MMOs we're going to talk about, we're going to have to completely diverge because these MMOs are, they're more than rumor but they're very much like in the very earliest, earliest stages you could possibly be. These are the MMOs that are wisps and hopes and dreams that we may have seen in a, an investor document. We may have gotten a, a, a tweet about, we may have some slight announcement here or there. Someone saying we're working on this, but no real big details. So obviously we can't go into positive and negatives about them. It's just really information on them that we have. Let's jump into them. The Amazon Games Lord of the Rings MMO was announced earlier this year. There's not a ton that is known about this game. The Lord of the Rings MMO from Amazon Game Studio that we hope to get eventually, as long as it's not canceled again. This time though, the deal is more direct with AGS working directly with Embracer, but Embracer since making this announcement has been suffering a lot of issues with with needing to close studios and do layoffs and things like that because of a two, I believe it was $2 billion deal that fell through an issue that is, you know, wide across Embracer, making them having to make some hard decisions. 
We'll have to see how this impacts the, the Amazon Game Studio MMO. And some of the uncertainty is on the other side with AGS. It will only be the second MMO ever developed by AGS, although they will have published several by the time this is coming out, including several that are on this list. But after New World, this will be their second fully developed MMO. And AGS, it's not even just MMOs, they haven't really developed much game-wise at all. They'll certainly have the money behind it, but there's concerns because there's not a lot of things there. We'll just need to see if they learn from New World's failures and their successes. Now, stop me if you've heard this before, but the Riot MMO is going to save the MMO genre. So it's like a common thing at this point. If Star Citizen is the great white whale of the indie MMO, the Riot MMO has to be that for the AAA market. We've been hearing about the Riot MMO in hushed terms for about three years now, and in that time, it's had no small amount of drama with the lead developer who'd been with Riot for years, Ghostcrawler, leaving just last year when with scant details on any sort of gameplay for the game. Much of the hope around the Riot MMO comes from two things an already established IP with deep lore, and the fact that it's Riot. This MMO for the time being is held up solely on the hopes and dreams of players desperate for a good AAA MMO, and while there's still a chance the MMO never sees the light of day, this one could be great just given Riot's track record. I've linked a website down below which seems to break news about the Riot MMO first, so check it out if you're interested. The source has speculated that the Riot MMO is probably and brace yourself for this one, probably still in the prototype phase. And that's pretty early in the Riot's self-posted development cycle. I wouldn't get your hopes up for the Riot MMO anytime soon, and as far as I'm concerned, from the things that we've heard about the Riot MMO, there's still probably a very good chance that this MMO could actually get cancelled before it gets launched. So this is where I need to pause here because I actually had a whole section on Soul Frame, the MMO, or at least the game that we thought was going to be an MMO coming from the creators of Warframe. At this point, I don't know that it's actually going to be an MMO. In fact, it's leaning more and more towards RPG. So I think that that's a game that I will save and put over to a potential RPG list unless we get any other updates on it being more of an MMO again. So that is why Soul Frame is no longer part of this list. So from the news about Soul Frame over to perhaps something that some people will not be super happy about, there's a couple of MMOs coming from NCSoft. And no, I'm not just talking about one that rhymes with groan and injury. One is a third person shooter MMO titled Project Triple L, which will be an alternate history sci-fi game coming to consoles and PC, perhaps as early as 2024. But since we received scant details in the game since it was announced in 2022, it remains to be seen if it'll be delayed. After all, they may not want it competing directly with Throne and Liberty, which will be has also been delayed to 2024. More on that in a bit. They're referring to the game as a trailblazing project that incorporates keywords like shooter, MMO, and open world. It could be an interesting take, and with not many MMOs out there that focus on being shooters at all, and certainly not third-person shooters, it could fill in a, a space in the in the genre, but there's some concerns around it and with you know just how we don't have much information on it. It also remains to be seen how this will work in concert with another somewhat unannounced MMO coming from NCSoft, NCSoft working directly with Sony, a Horizon Zero Dawn MMO, which I assume given Horizon Zero Dawn, the way that it works will also have so at least some element of shooting. I'm assuming first person shooting with that one. That one, I think, is one that I am a little personally more interested in just because the setting sounds more interesting. Now, this next one, this one we got news about as I was writing this script. So it's a good thing that I took a while to get this script done. EverQuest 3 or EverQuest Next Next or whatever we want to call it. EverQuest 4 because there's also EverQuest Online Adventures, whatever it is. We might be getting one. As EG7 is wont to do, we got a bombshell report from their market day for investors, and EverQuest 3 is under consideration for development starting in 2025 with a targeted release of 2028. The approach with this game seems to be to build off of knowledge of prior EverQuest games, meaning its budget and development time could be less. 
At least that's what I'm kind of speculating based off of some of the things they were talking about around this announcement of EverQuest 3. That they were looking at how From Software made Elden Ring for about $30 million by making the same game several times before. But speaking of older, huge MMO developers that have actually lost a bit of their shine over the last couple decades, Blizzard has actually been, in, been kind of busy with another MMO, a long rumored survival MMO called Odyssey. Blizzard is taking a bit of a gamble here with a survival style MMO, a genre that few teams have attempted but hasn't really translated into massive MMO success yet. Even New World, which had the hallmarks of a survival PvP MMO, pivoted mid-development to become more PvE focused, a path continue they continue down to this day. We know that Odyssey will feature PvE combat, hunting, building, crafting, and even the possibility of player shops. Look to BlizzCon 2023 for potential information of this game really is inching closer to release as we might expect. These next two are interesting projects because they've kind of just been announced by people who departed their old studios. Remember when I mentioned the lead developer that left Riot MMO, Ghostcrawler? Well, it didn't take long for Ghostcrawler to pop up elsewhere. For those unfamiliar with Ghostcrawler, he was the lead design system designer for World of Warcraft and had been with Riot since 2013. Announced in April of 2023, Ghostcrawler has started his own studio, a remote work studio with a goal to move fast and go big. He also announced in the same tweet that he has a strategic partner aligned with the vision that and will be creating an MMO or at least something MMO like. This is perhaps the most nebulous one and the one we had the least amount of information on, but I thought it was interesting since it's tied somewhat to the Riot MMO with Ghostcrawler leaving to create a new studio and potentially work on a brand new MMO, or as they said, an MMO like. It's so nebulous that really imagine whatever you want. That's, that's kind of the fun of that one. <laughs> and speaking of devs with history creating their own studios, Jack Emmert, formerly of Daybreak and Cryptic Studios, founded their own studio back in May of 2022, Jackalyptic Games. And in a partnership with NetEase, is currently working on a Warhammer 40k MMO being built in Unreal Engine 5. The game is still very early in the idea phase, so we don't have a ton of information on it. We just know that it's currently being built. Now, you may have noticed at this point, that there's one huge MMO that I have left out, one that many of you already know about, Throne and Liberty. There is a distinct reason for this, and that's autoplay. For me, it's not that the game may have some semblance of pay to win, or at least pay for convenience. If I were using that as an eliminating factor, I'd have had to cut Bandai Namco and Amazon Games Blue Protocol from the list, though we haven't yet seen exactly how it will look with the global release version. It's got plenty of concerns. So I sat back and I thought, you know, autoplay is just such a thing that is to have it built as as a function of the game. It was just something I just didn't have any interest in covering. And then we got some major announcements on Throne and Liberty. All of this has kind of changed because NCSoft has basically done the good thing with autoplay, or at least good for people like me. After lackluster responses on autoplay from Amazon Game Studios, as recently as Gamescom 2023, NCSoft kind of came out swinging and confirmed that they have not only permanently removed autoplay, but also restructured growth or experience gain around its removal, which is an essential step to making sure the game isn't too grindy when they've taken out a part of it that would have been used to supplement the grind. Throne and Liberty is the most imminent game coming sometime in 2024, followed by Blue Protocol, and I've covered that a lot on this channel, so I'll link that video down below. My name is Redbeard Flynn, that was a super freaking long video, I am exhausted and I have dinner downstairs, so I'm gonna go do that. Thank you anyone who is still here after all of that, I really appreciate you. If you're here, and just let, let, let us know down in the comment section below, what MMO are you excited about? Thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful day. I'm tired, bye. It's not that those settings are bad, just that they're overrepresented. It's not that those settings are bad, just that they're overrepresented. It's not that those settings are bad, it's just that they're kind of overrepresented.